Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing again. That's right. When you don't know what to do, just keep on breathing. From beautiful Huntington Beach, California, on the HealthyLife.net radio network, heard in all 50 states and 135 countries, all positive talk radio. Welcome to all my listeners out there on Radio Land. I'm Dave, the caregiver's caregiver, with a slightly hoarse voice because I spoke for three days at the Los Angeles Convention Center, helping caregivers to survive and thrive and sign up for coaching, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I don't think I've spoken that long in a long time. So I got to get used to it. And uh, we are also at caregiverdave.com. And we're also coming to you live and on demand 24 7 on numerous syndicated radio and podcast networks on 26 global audio video platforms, including iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Vimeo, Stitcher Radio, Blog Talk Radio, Castbox, and just way too many to tell right now <laughs> in fact we're proud to be voted number one caregiver podcast of the top 50 on player fm and number two caregiver podcast on feedspot out of the top 60 and number two on caringvillage.com and we have an especially exciting show planned for today i am excited um we have laura linder an eternal optimist and driven by her love to give her role as CEO is to continue to be her authentic self, to share her excitement with the team, to be grateful, to recognize and reward the talent they have uh, attracted, and to promote great talent from within. Our promise is to set the standard for excellence with the highest quality care for our team, our clients, and their families to achieve optimal health and well-being. Laura Steading graduated from the Los Angeles Training Institute of Substance Abuse through the state of California for her CADP1 certificate. And Laura has worked in the rehab industry as a registered alcohol and drug technician, resident advisor, resident mentor, case manager, and counselor. She is well equipped. <laughs> She has worked in both individual and group settings in both residential and intensive outpatient treatment. Uh, before following her passion to save first responders. But before we get started, I do want to take this moment and thank my last week's guest, Juan Williams. He has a life of education that includes an AS in mechanical engineering from the University of Hawaii and a bachelor's interdisciplinary business from Arizona State University. And Mr. Williams brings his personal health crisis uh, as well as the life challenges of others to promote a total understanding of personal self-help health. <laughs> and just a reminder, you can watch, uh, my voice is terrible. I'm so sorry, but hopefully you can make me out. And just a reminder, you can watch or listen to that interview and all our interviews on our membership website, caregiverdave.com or any of our other 26 global networks that I mentioned earlier. All right, enough of that. Laura, so great to have you on the Caregiver Dave show. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, I like to ask my guests just who is Laura Linder and why was she placed on this earth? There's an easy question for you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Who is Laura Linder? Laura uh, Linder is the middle child of seven girls. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it took me a long time to figure out why I was put on this earth. <laughs> just the last five years, I realized it's, it's a really selfish reason. And that is, I feel happy when I'm giving to somebody else it i can't it's a it's a selfish thing i feel really happy when i'm giving that's and because it's more blessed to give than to receive i guess so well then that's why i'm here but gosh i have six kids 11 grandkids six kids uh, wow. so naturally a nurturer and um just my story is that, you know, I grew up around alcoholism on both sides of my family. Yeah, yeah. let's get into your story. Um, okay. So how do you think, because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there with addictions. How did you become an alcoholic? Were you born that way? Uh, was life so hard that you needed to drown your sorrows? I mean, what's your story? Well, 
growing up because my family would gather and all my aunts and uncles and cousins and everybody would be over. They were German and Irish, so they were always drinking. And so even the smell of alcohol to me meant happy times. Uh huh. Sense. My grandmother used to give me um, an ice cube out of her her um, Jack Daniels, and I would <laughs> like I was two years old, right? Wow. Um, I guess I just kind of in my mind alcohol and family and happiness all kind of went together, but then I didn't really drink all through, you know, high school and stuff. I just, um, I was a good kid and, um, got married. When I look back, I start to realize that I had a tendency to always want to have alcohol at every function that we would have, but maybe that's also because it, you know, it, I learned that, that, um, way of living. Sure. So, uh, I really didn't start drinking hard till I was about 26 when I went through a divorce and mm. I was just off to the races and <laughs> ugly, ugly. But I struggled with that for about 30 years. My wow. dad, was, my dad was a fireman who was also, uh, uh, he, um, had issues with alcoholism, but back then you, it was a stigma. Sure. Tell anybody he had to sneak off to a doctor every week for a year. And uh. I believe he took an abuse just to get past it without anybody knowing uh -huh. at his work. Cause he was the captain. He would have been, you know, demoted. Sure. So yeah, it just runs in my family. Um, obviously life, uh, you know, my, a lot of my story, yeah. uh, mutual friends and family, but um, <laughs> I think <laughs> thing that came, came easy to me. So I struggled for 30 years trying to get over in and out of rehabs Um and always asking that same question, you know, why didn't I stay sober this last time? What was it that was keeping me from staying sober? Um, every time I got sober, 100%, I, that, that was the last time I was ever going to drink, never going to drink again. Um, and, you know, I might stay sober for a couple of years and then something would happen or it was a Tuesday afternoon and I happened to be at the grocery store walking down the, there was never any rhyme or reason to it. Mm. other than this last time around i realized it was because the aftercare programs that are available to people are not uh they're not available really they're, i say they're available to people they're just really not there are some programs out there that obviously everybody knows aa and there's a yeah. called the smart program and it, it's all self-will so the whole idea of being able to have um a safety net, the support system of your family and your friends, and how do they get involved? A lot of times they just don't even know what to do. A lot of people, sure. they give up on them. So um, I thought, I'm going to do something different this time around. I'm going to start focusing on, that's when I ask myself, what do I want to be when I grow up? What do I want to do? How? Mm -hmm. And I started to realize I'm the happiest when I'm giving. So I thought, I'm going to take all the time that I would spend, you know, obsessing in my mind about alcohol or drinking alcohol uh, and, and focus it into something that makes me give back to other people and help other people. Like I said, it's kind of selfish for me because it made me feel so happy. So basically focusing mm. on that, obviously, and, and this for me goes without saying, and that is, you know, my prayer and my meditation and my connection every day with people call God, all kinds of things, but whatever that means to you as a person, um, it's it, it that is without a doubt my guiding force right to stay sober this time and and not when i say sober i mean mentally sober and physically sober from any kind of you know substance um, would you I, believe in zero tolerance of any substance at all yes yes yeah, me too <laughs> but, yes, yeah however there are programs out there that do the you know harm reduction and i think that's some people will guarantee it's the only way to go, right? Um, mm -hmm. Not for me. Not for me because I take one sip and I am. Right. Most out. people. Yeah. Most people are that way. In fact, uh, you know, I know a lot of drug addicts and they'll stop drugs, but they're still drinking beer and, and doing stuff like that. And I, I try yeah. to tell them, if you want people to start trusting you, <laughs> you yeah. need to do something so radical saying zero tolerance. I don't uh, drink anything. You yeah. know? I mean, I would hire a guy like that who told me that, um, th that he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke marijuana, he doesn't do anything. 
over someone who says, yeah, I was a drug addict. You know, I did heroin and stuff. I only have beer now. I wouldn't hire him because well, you're yeah. only one drink uh, away from going back to where you were. Right. Yeah. It's a mindset. It, again, like it's, it's a, to me, it's like a promise with me and God. It's my mindset. Yeah. Every day I had to say, okay, today, thank you for a new day. I'm so happy to be here. In fact, at 11, 11, I don't know if you heard a minute ago, my alarm went off. I set my <laughs> alarm 11, 11 every day. Because my days get so busy. I'm sure you understand that. Yes. I just have to stop dead in my track because my alarm is going off and I stop. And for a solid minute, I just am grateful for whatever I feel I'm grateful for at that moment. And most of the time, it's whoever I'm sitting with. So you actually were here during that. So I'm very grateful to be on this show. It's just you were talking and I didn't want to interrupt you when my 11, 11 alarm. Went off. Ah. But, you know, it's, you do that every hour or just at 11. I did that every hour. My first two years of sobriety, I did that every hour at like 1, 11, 2, 11. It was, I, I don't know why I pick 11, 11. I think because my daughter likes one. Yeah, it's on, it's on her neck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's so, how I met you through your daughter. And, and all I knew about you was that, well, my mom was an alcoholic, but she's sober now. You know, yeah. and I really didn't have much of a backstory until... Just by coincidence, we happened to be at the same meeting, which was your meeting. I was there for a different reason, and and I saw all of you, and I says, "What are you all doing here in my church?" Yeah, right. <laughs> and and you got up on the stage, and I was so impressed with uh, uh, you're such an overachiever. Um, as as far as you sunk down into the cesspool, you have risen <laughs> above yeah. towards the heavens, and good for you. But I'm I'm really impressed at all your accomplishments, and we'll talk about them uh, today. But um, so let's talk about how you're helping people. Uh, you you started a nonprofit organization. I mean, it is so hard to do that. I mean, I have been thinking about doing it, and I I'm not even going to do it because it's just too hard, and I don't want to deal with you know all the taxes and all the, the forms and the requirements. And but you just jumped jumped right into the uh, ocean out of a boat that wasn't sinking and says, I'm going to do it. So tell well, us that story. Yeah. Um, well, I knew I wanted mm. to do something when I sobered up this last time. And I thought, you know, I, I want to do something to give back to others. And my initial thought was, and this is not something that I'm saying no to. It is something I will do one day. And that is um, to, to open a rehab center at, with aftercare and everything that goes along with it for, for professional women. Um, we have so much on our plates. I obviously had to go through this like, too. Like a Betty Ford type of thing. Yeah, yeah, but exactly. But hey, not dream dream high. That's the only way you read. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and the thing about a professional woman is we have so much guilt and things that go along with our life. We're we're moms, we're yeah. wives, we're you know, caregivers, we're all these yeah. things. Um and I was considered a functional alcoholic. I was a single mom for 17 years. And um, my kids always ate. They always had a roof over their head. Life was for normal as they knew it, right? The only difference was they knew their mom drank. Um, thank goodness I never got any legal issue problems or, you know, like a lot of people do. Um, but I, my initial thought was I'm going to open a rehab for women because I understand what they're going through. And because I've been through it, there's a different level of respect. When I would go into rehabs, the people that were there working that had a history of alcoholism or addiction or mental health issues, I connected with so much deeper than the, just the book smart ones. Not that they're not good too. It's just as an addict, alcoholic, mental health person myself, um, it's just an unspoken respect. Right. Um, so that was my original thought. And I thought, well, okay, I'm going to do that. Then I had a friend who was a first responder die of suicide. Mm. Uh, he was a fireman. And then a family member of mine who was a sheriff's deputy had a mental breakdown, almost committed suicide. And my whole focus started to shift at, and I started looking into what's going on with first responders. Yeah. Well, there's nothing out there. The only things they have out there available right now are um, if you if you have an issue, you go within your wellness department, wherever it is that you're working. You tell them, hey, you know what? I'm having an issue. They they you, you pay like mm. 600 bucks to go to an eight hour course and you're all better. But then they take your your what do they say? They strip you of your your badge, your gun and your dignity. 
and they mm. put you behind a desk. So you're kind of in trouble at that point. So it, the stigma has really been, a. it keeps them from asking for the help that they need. So the reason that they commit suicide, they don't think there's anything, any place else to go. They'd rather yeah. go. And, and a lot of times they commit suicide in a way that people don't realize they committed suicide. You know, they, everybody will sweep it under the carpet because they're right. here. So and I thought father being a, a captain in the yeah. fire department, you kind of lived it. Didn't you? Yes. Can yeah. you look, can you look back and see all the red flags now? Yes. Oh <laughs> yeah. You know, when you're a kid, you just, that, that's the norm. Whatever's happening in your world is the norm. You just don't know any different, but, um, yeah, I uh, so you started this this uh, foundation mm -hmm. uh, or nonprofit uh, called Exclusively First Responders. Yes. And um, we're going to take a break in about three minutes. So give us okay. three minutes version, then we'll come back okay. and you can finish up. Yeah. So I didn't know if I was going to go for profit or nonprofit, but because I'd been in the rehab industry for so long and I see how they're just, you know, ripping off the insurance companies and not giving them good quality yeah. care that people really need to get. I went through this myself. I've been to five different rehabs. You know, I mean, I'm telling you, I know what to do, what not to do. And I thought I want to start someplace that is not prof not for profit so that the insurance companies aren't alerted that will alert the HR department and these people will end up losing their jobs eventually. Mm -hmm. So I decided it took me two years because my investors kept saying, we're only going to invest if you go for profit, but my heart and God inside of me would not allow it. Literally for two years, I sat on the fence. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in 2020, I said, I'm going nonprofit. And you're right. It's a lot <laughs> of work, but you no, know, it feels good. So. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. Well, listen, that's a good time. We'll take a break and we'll okay. be right back. Don't go away. Anytime we suffer loss, we grieve. And a lot of people don't realize what even the grief process is. But it could be five to seven steps ranging from denial, I don't believe this is happening, anger, oh my gosh, I'm so upset this is happening, to a form of bargaining, how can I get out of this, to depression, which is a very serious thing because that often leads to suicide. And then finally, finally, after you realize you have no more control over your situation and you're totally okay with the new normal that it brings, that wonderful, wonderful place called acceptance. Hey, we're back on the Caregiver Dave Show. I'm Dave Nassani and my guest, Laura Linder, is talking about how she started a nonprofit organization out of a past of alcoholism and and uh, her heart now is into first responders. So you were about to tell us uh, about your your um, pro nonprofit called Exclusively First Responders. Why that name, first of all? Well, because it's peer to peer only between first responders who are in a you know, an environment just among their peers to get well, to get well, because we have found that first responders sometimes don't get the help they need <clears throat> because they, if they're law enforcement, they go into a rehab. They don't, when you go to rehab, you don't know who the other clients are going to be. And, you know, it can be a very unsafe place for them. If there was somebody, if some criminals that are either getting ready to go to, to jail or maybe just came out of jail no. um, they tend to get pegged in there. So they don't sleep at night. So I thought, you know, there's got to be a place. One of my friends passed away, literally drank himself to death. Um, as a first responder, he and I were actually kind of neck and neck. We've known each other since we were 12. With our drinking, you know, we would see each other in meetings and try to support one another and um, <clears throat> both of us on our own personal destruction. Mm. Uh, but he would always leave the rehabs and, and it was because he said, I don't feel safe in there, you know? Really? As soon as even even the fire department, you know, firemen, fire uh, fighters uh, just didn't feel safe. So I thought there's got to be a place they can go where they feel safe, where they can heal among their peers. Um, and, you know, what's cool about this in Santa Clarita Valley, where we're at, there are more first responders per capita right yeah. here than anywhere else in the United States. I so, know that's because it's the second safest place to live in the country. <laughs> yeah, right. I know it's it's. um. So it's, it makes sense to start right here. I mean, this is where the Saugus 
shootings happened, you know, and nobody really thinks about the first responders that have to show up to these places. You know, we think about all these poor, the victims and yes, my heart goes out to all of them and the families. Um, But there, there are other people affected as well. And those would be like the first responders. Like my, um, my family member who was a sheriff's deputy came across his best friend who was dead at a scene. First one to show up, you know, and, um, was never the same after that. So you, it, it could take one instance where they instantly just get the PTSD so severely, they just want to give up. They just can't handle it anymore. So our whole idea is let's give them a place where they can heal among their peers, where they get the top of the line help that they need. Um, a lot of these places that are open right now are just in it for the money. Literally, okay. they're even something called body broking. If you've never watched it, there's a movie called Body Brokers, and it's got uh, Billy Bob Thornton in it, and it is an amazing true story about what happens in rehabs. So the whole idea is keep it, keep it legal. That's another reason I wanted to go nonprofit. Was you know you you can't make any mistakes with a nonprofit. You got to keep everything, all your T's crossed and your I's dotted, and it is a lot of work. <laughs> well, well. You're a glutton for punishment, but uh, God bless you, you know, because that's what it it takes. It's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would would do it. (laughs) So what what is your mission statement? What is your vision and what sets you apart? Well, our mission statement is to open up exclusively peer-to-peer rehab for first responders who can heal among their peers from PTSD, mental health, addiction, and suicide ideation. Um, Our vision is to have um, a gated location that is confidential, where we will have um, holistic modalities, a lot of holistic leading. Um, I really believe that yoga, things that really quiet your mind are very very helpful. And a lot of the holistic, you know, therapies are that way. Plus, we're also going to be using um, the clinical based. We're, We're actually using a... I don't know if anybody has uh, ever heard of EMDR, if you've heard of EMDR therapy, but it's an eye movement therapy that gets a g- excellent results with people who have PTSD. It re- it basically removes the emotional attachment to the memory. It's wow. really cool. Um, and it usually takes about nine weeks. We're actually using a program that is an enhanced version of that. And it takes nine days. So you really need to be in, <laughs> in, in, in yeah, in a, um, like a residential environment for that because it's just, it's an ongoing they process. Focused. Mm-hmm. So, so, so P- P- PTSD seems to be the most common ailment for first responders. I mean, you know, you think about 9 11, uh, you got firemen, policemen, you got the EMTs, the, the paramedics. Uh, am I missing anybody? Yes. Actually, the very first people that you call when you call 911, the telecommunicators, people on the phone, they, that's have- right. They go through some stress yeah. hearing hearing uh, tragic uh, sounds and and yeah. words and screams and yes and, uh, wow and the list goes on and on i mean those are just the top of the head ones but <clears throat> first responders can be nurses and doctors think about covid you know, and and hard coming head. into the hospital all torn up yeah yeah they're professional any of the any of the professionals in the healthcare industry who are uh, you know they're through emergency situations wow yeah so um and P- I think that the medical community really doesn't understand PTSD um, because uh, I think the the military were the first people, you know, Agent Orange, uh, how it was affecting, you know, either them physically or, or, you know, they used to call it shell shock when you get home and you all of a sudden you wake up out of a dead sleep and you're strangling your wife and stuff like that. (laughs) And and it's just recently where they're starting to uh, pay for um, treatments to that. But it, there's still a lot of trouble getting money from um, yeah. the governments and the counties and the cities and the and the councils. Uh, tell us about uh, the troubles that you've discovered is going on with, you know, getting getting payment for treatment. Um, with regards to nonprofit getting payment. Um, just for example, a police officer I happen to know one of my guests. Uh, a few weeks ago, a police officer, the wife of a police officer, I should say, got shot in the head and has a traumatic brain injury. 
and they're just fighting with the city. I won't mention the city's name, but the city yeah. council who um, is using taxpayer money to fight against paying, uh, you know, workers comp or, uh, you know, whatever it is that they deserve. And it yeah. just seems wrong, you know. That is an issue that is ongoing. I have a friend, Christina Karina, who you saw at the function that night, mm -hmm. who in the, I, I want to say like late 90s, early 2000s, was was a, um, a cop and they had a shootout down in Santa Monica and she got shot. And to this day, she's still fighting workman's comp. And so she has set up uh, a program where she tries to help people who are trying to get the funding. And and because I haven't gotten to that point yet, I mean, we're still in the, the beginnings of you know, fundraising to open the doors. Um, yeah, I hear a lot of nightmares that I, I'm not looking forward to that, but there's got to be laws that change. You know, and as a nonprofit, I can't. Awareness is the first step. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, just making people aware that without our military, without our first responders, who would be saving us and making us so that we feel comfortable sure. sleeping at night? Well, who'd ever think that the VA, uh, with all of their problems and, and uh, incompetencies, uh, was able to change, but uh, you know, people started complaining, and and uh, it's getting better. It's not perfect, right. but it's getting better. Yeah. And, uh, hopefully, we'll have the same vision for first responders as well. Because uh, uh, do you have people in the military? Um, that, are they considered first responders, or they I guess are. They, if you're in the National Guard, perhaps you know, I don't know. They are, and and um, the reason we don't really um, advertise that so much is because we've. <clears throat> We know that a lot of them hang around each other. You know, the military and the first responders are, tend to be very close. There's a group called the Guardians here in Santa Clarita Valley. Yeah. And they are a great, great gr group of uh, first responders and military who meet once once a, a week to support one another through mental health and addiction issues. So it's really a we've worked with them when we um, we had a PTSD 911, the documentary. I think that's where you. Yeah, met. that's where we met. Yeah, um, that. You know, they were there. They helped us put that together. And it was just so good to see how they just blend. So if we were, you know, if we had beds available and, you know, somebody came and they were desperate and they were military, of course, we're going to take military in. Um, what was your question? I went way off, didn't I? No, I was just saying, uh, is military involved? You answered the question. But yeah. we're going to take another break. Uh, we'll be right back. Don't go away. Dave Nassani, the caregiver's caregiver has just released his sixth book entitled It's My Life Too, Thrive to Stay Alive as a Caregiver. It was specifically written for caregivers who know they should be putting their needs first, but just don't know how. Dave is the sole caregiver to his wife, Charlene, since 1996. He knows firsthand what caregivers are going through because he is one. He now speaks all across the country, offering caregivers his amazing caregiver support package. Even the airlines tell us that in the event of an emergency, to put your oxygen mask on first before you help your child with their mask. They know that those who don't heed their advice often black out, thus becoming unable to help either themselves or their child. And caregivers are exactly the same way. It's my life to thrive and stay alive as a caregiver will help caregivers who are neglecting their sleep, diet, and social life and learn to put their needs first Pick up your copy today or buy one for your special caregiver on sale everywhere and at caregiverdave.com. And welcome back to the Caregiver Dave Show. I'm Dave Nassani and our guest, Laura Linder, and we're talking about PTSD and her brand new um, nonprofit called Exclusively <laughs> First Responders. <laughs> I'm a little I slow, but I get there. Um so let's talk more about your your company culture. I mean, uh, I don't know what else to call it, but um, tell us more about why you're different than all the other places that someone can go for help. Uh, with regards to our with, clients? With or? regards to anything you want to talk about, because, okay. you know, you've uh, how are you training your employees, you know? Um, okay. ongoing education, your, your, the culture of the uh, company, you know, what uh, what training they have. Because let's face it, I mean, if I came to work for you, I'm, I'm like clueless, you know. Yeah. How would you get me up to speed, you know? Well, we're only going to hire licensed and certified um, 
therapists. Oh, that's good. A lot of places do not. A lot of places uh. say, we want you to go out and get your, it's called an RADT. You go online, it's supposed to be like an eight-hour class online. And it's basically just like sexual harassment and basic information. And now you can be a technician, they call you, and, and you could actually give medication. Really? Yeah. It, to me, that there are, there's so many red flags right there. <laughs> so we're going to do every. – I've seen some places that are, are – good at this i mean places that are, have a lot of money like the bed before pl places that are well established don't do that but the people that want to make a quick buck and they say hey we can start a rehab <clears throat> let's just get somebody in here who has their therapist license and we'll put everybody under them and we'll make you know the last place i worked believe it or not it was eight thousand dollars a day for these women to stay there that's what their insurance was being so another thing that happens is, you know, as soon as somebody's insurance runs out, maybe it's only been a month and they really need like 90 days in there, they're kicked out. Well, their program isn't even barely getting started. So what we're doing different is each person that comes in is absolutely an individual. We realize everybody has their own personal problems. Um, so we take that person and they help to co-author their own program. And the reason is we could tell them what to do all day long, but if it's not moving them somewhere on the inside, uh -huh. they're going to relapse once they leave. So it's, you know, of course we're going to have, you know, all the different, and we already have some great therapists just waiting. We've got people waiting to be hired. Um, when they get hired, we're planning to keep them involved in their own personal mental well-being journey uh -huh. so, uh, that they live what they're also sharing with the clients. So that's kind of a cool thing. I worked at a company once that was, they took such good care of their, their employees. I'll tell you who it is. It was called modern postcard and they are amazing. They're down in Carlsbad, but like they had breakfast and lunch, full breakfast, full lunch every day. I'm sure part of the problem with the reason was so that people don't leave at lunch and not come back, but they would always, you know, make, make us feel like we were worthy of our jobs. Um, it was just a great, great culture in there. Uh, and I, I just want to make sure that when people are working with us, they feel a real part of, and, and their, their voice is heard. You know? Yeah. And you actually have um, a relative who is a sheriff's deputy, right? Was. Yes. Was, yes. And so uh, you've got fir firsthand experience as to what's out there and why it doesn't work, and you're trying to make it better, I'm, I'm assuming. Yes. Yes, there's just nothing out here that for exclusively for first responders. Uh, there might be one or two that have tried and failed because they're going for profit, and it's it in the end it just hurts the 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 client. First well, you you seem to have a lot of friends and partners up on the stage who who are standing behind you and and helping you out. So you've got to raise some money, right? A couple million bucks. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And what's your plan, Laura? <laughs> How's that going to well, happen? We are just starting our our real fundraising. Um, it took this long just to get everything in compliance, and you yeah, know, get all your ducks in order. Yeah, so we're actually having a, a um, golf tournament oh. on October sixteenth at Sand Canyon Country Club. Uh, That's a good idea. That, that we just last week I met with them. We got it all um, kind of squared away, so we'll you'll start seeing that around quite often. Where will it be? It's going to be at the Sand Canyon Country Club. Okay. Yes. And do you play golf, by the way? <laughs> you no. Know, if I played golf, it would be a very dangerous golf <laughs> <laughs> golf yeah, course. And I play once a year, whether I need to or not. So that'll yeah. tell you how much golf I play. Yeah, I know. You know, I just I. I try to play, but every time okay. I see the ball still at my feet. So <laughs> I never really learned, but it's going to be a whole lot of fun. We've got, um, I've already got some donations uh, in. I'm going to have sponsorship levels for people in town today. I'm There's a, a function in town with the chamber today. So I'm going to go there and, and talk to some people and yeah. And so. you seem to be well received. People are receiving your message. Yes. Yes. Now they need what I need from them is I need them to realize because we're 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 trying to we're, I have um, been working with COC COC is the local college uh -huh. last two semesters I've had interns working with me from the school in different department 
areas that we need. And it's been wonderful. And I've got uh, one this, this semester who is writing grants, learning to write grants. And um, that takes so much time. I've been doing the same thing myself. And and I'm obviously not very good at it. I'm better just <laughs> getting out there, meeting people, finding out what they do, see if they want to help support us. Um, so he's doing some grants. Um, we did get the, the the Google grants, the ad grants, oh, yeah. um, 10000 a month for that, which is How amazing. did you get that? You have to be a 501c3. They do a little research on you. And then- Really? Yeah. But you've it's a lot of work to keep that up and rolling. So um, I don't have the expertise on that. I'm looking at hiring somebody right now to- You're putting a team together. Yeah. Yeah. To yeah. do that. So once we get the word out there, I'm sure people will realize this is just, um, it's so necessary. If we don't take care of the ones that take care of us, what's going to happen when you call 911 and no one shows up? Exactly. We take them for granted. Yeah. So what happens in our life, we call 911. Faithfully, someone shows up to, to save the day. If they're suffering, then what? Scary, scary thought. Well, listen, that's a good time. We'll take a break and we'll okay. be right back. Don't go away. We are a community of caregivers that understands and supports you wherever you are in your journey. We are a place to connect with other caregivers, but more importantly, a place to get practical, actionable help. There are lots of ways for you to get support. First of all, you can download our welcome pack. This will get you started on your Thrive journey. Next, you can ask and get answers to your questions by posting them here in our private Facebook groups. You can also get live online support by attending one of our live weekly Connect webinars. You can get practical, actionable advice by listening to our weekly podcast. You can hear and read other stories about other caregivers' experiences. Plus, add your own in our weekly Share Your Story forum, posted every Tuesday in the Facebook group. You can access essential resources and download practical Thrive Solutions Packs, all of which are geared to help you thrive as a caregiver. You can get lifetime access to all of our resources. Again, we're here to support you and help you thrive and to enjoy your life as a caregiver. And remember, this is a place to get hope, not just cope. Hey, we're back on the Caregiver Dave Show. I'm Dave Nassani and my guest, Laura Linder. How has COVID affected um, all of the suicides? Um, there was a, a guy in New York, he was an EMT and I was listening to the news and he was saying how, you know, they're lucky to get, you know, five calls a day, but they were getting 25 calls a day. And usually uh, it would be overdose or, you know, heart attack, things like that. But with COVID, because they didn't know if the heart attack was COVID related, they would be so afraid. So they had that fear that they didn't carry prior to that, that they're going to catch this. They might catch this, this thing, this COVID. So, um, with, you know, having so many more calls every day and that fear, um, they, there was a greater amount of suicides. Uh, it, the pressure just got to them. So yeah. we're still feeling the tail end of that, but they still commit suicide 30% more than the general population. Every wow. single day, uh, we lose a first responder to suicide and they died of suicide so sad. line of duty. People don't realize that for the it's whole family. Yeah. Yeah. And it does affect the whole family. We also have a family program that goes side by side with the client program because it's a family disease. All of it, you know, it affects the family. I've seen it affect, you know, my family. What is the plan uh, if you do uh, partner with the college? Well, with regards to partnering with the college, it's more um, they have an internship program. And as as an employee uh, employer, you can get in touch with them and then say, you know, I. I'd like to have somebody come in for the next semester to do mm. this. And I will teach them how to do this, uh, whatever this is. Yeah. Uh, that's been just wonderful. And so last semester, I started it this the semester before this one. And um, most of them have stayed on as volunteers because they just loved it so much. So I think it's kind of interesting how it's growing just, um, you know, uh, naturally. With, with regards to the college, the college does have another thing too. That's kind of cool that they're just starting. It's, um, it's called, um, 
uh, the nonprofit leadership program, and they're doing podcasts like this for the, all the local nonprofit leaders so that people can know who are the nonprofits in our town and how can they support you. So it, yeah. it's kind of cool. Fundraising is a very important uh, quality or, or training that everyone who's you know in business or coming uh, out of college should get. And this is very valuable to these people just to learn how to fundraise. I mean, uh, when I think of fundraising, it, it doesn't seem too uh, too pleasant to pick up the phone and start asking people for money. But the, yeah. there's a there's a method to the madness, right? I mean, yeah. what have you figured out? Um, you know how to train people <laughs> to wish. be a fundraiser yet, so where it's not embarrassing wow. and it's not uh, unpleasant, where it's actually fun, you know. And and of course, you're going to get more no's than you get yeses, but. Uh, a lot of people look forward to the no's so that they can reach the yeses because it's all a numbers yeah. game, isn't it? It really is. I haven't had additional time to just focus solely on fundraising, and I'm just at that point right now. And I would say this, though. Um, I just got a really amazing donation from uh, Steve Kim. At oh, wow. And I think once that initial big amount yeah. is in, it's like, I can do this. Okay. <laughs> I got this. Yeah, it's a model that works. Yes. Right. So pretty excited. I think um, I like, there's something called volunteer match and I've put things out and I've had volunteers reply from there and help out with some of our functions that we've done. We have an ongoing series of webinars. There's a company called change wins that from Canada that works with us. They are, um, psychologists and they have interns too. And what they do is they have their interns put together. Like this last webinar was uh, on self care, you know, how to take care of yourself when yeah. things are hard. Um, the time before that was mindfulness and anxiety. And then in, in about a month, we have another one coming up. So in anything that any donations they raise with that come to us, which was, it's just a really cool thing. Just, I met the owner Rob on a networking function during covid and we just thought we saw something there we could work together so networking is a really big part of it just keep, mm. keeping us in front of people oh well, then i i think i told you i may not have told you that um bill miranda count city councilman bill miranda he came to our function i think he saw that and then afterwards we had um he invited me to his podcast last week oh, and good. Yeah, and his wife is so sweet. So I said, oh, we want to take you and your wife to lunch sometime. So Thursday, we get to go do that. So I think just meeting the right people that believe in what you're doing will help yes. too. Yes, yeah. absolutely. It's all about um, you know hiring the right people, meeting the right people. Because there yeah. are people out there, There's there are foundations with lots and lots of money. And I, I understand the problem with a lot of these foundations. They don't know who, give, who to give the money to. You know, I mean, that's a good problem to have when you got so much money that you don't know who to give it to. Because you don't <laughs> want to give it to the wrong people. You don't want to give it to the names. people I will where, be <laughs> where their administrative costs are like 50% and only yeah. half of it goes to, you know. Uh, you know. So uh, I, I know you, you'll you probably have a very slim, uh, you know, administration uh, cost and uh, where the vast majority of funds will be actually going to help um first responders as opposed to you know paying for someone's pension plan right exactly yeah the, our administrative is, is not going to be real high yeah it's uh yeah but hey i'd like <laughs> i'd like those foundations to like take a listen yeah. to what we have to offer and you know i'm assuming um i used to know a guy uh who he was a professional fundraiser. I mean, and I don't know how he did it, but he was very successful in raising funds. And I think he would take a small cut because that, that was his right. fee. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's people out there who who are very good at it and they enjoy it. And uh, and if they're good at it, you know, they deserve to get a little finder's fee or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, have you yeah, met I'm anyone like that to, yet? I am open to all of that. It's interesting that you all would say about. that. There was a guy that... Uh, reached out to me and said he could do this. And and I said, okay, well, can you give me some information on you? I, so, you know, this whole thing is a learning process. Yeah. He's, he's like, well, I don't have a website and I don't have, and he, you know, he had an email. 
So yeah, I, red, red flag. I Googled his name. My kids are always like, mom, you got to check him out. <laughs> I couldn't find anything. So I had to politely decline. But so I realized, you know, there are people out there that. Um, There's a lot of scams out there. Let's face that's it. <laughs> what I was, yes, I know. So if you're, if somebody's listening to this or watching this and they're, they are a professional fundraiser. I would be more than happy to talk to them about it because. Yeah. Now I don't know what their fees are, uh, but uh, you know, I would hope that they would be reasonable. I mean, 10% seems reasonable to me. Right. If they're yeah. really good, maybe 15, maybe 20, but I don't think I would go over that. Uh, yeah. I heard some people would actually charge 50%, which is outrageous, especially yeah. if it's a good cause like this, you know, they, yeah. they, they've got to be a partner. They got to have some skin in the game and, and, uh, you know, everyone sacrifices. So if you're out there and yeah. you want to do good and you want to save lives, you know, I'm saving caregivers lives. You guys can save first responders lives. And this girl, I'm telling you, she is passionate and she is going to get the job done and she's going to get it done for as cheaply as possible and professional as possible. Right. Because um, you're just a very professional person. Apparently, you were like this before you had a, an alcohol problem. Yes. So well, I was like this on track and then you got off track and now you're back yeah. on track. Yeah. Yeah. I just bouncing around, but Hey, going on six years. So life is good. And I, I have something that my passion is driving me just to want to stay healthy. And I don't even think about using it's the craziest thing. I don't think about drinking. Too busy, I, huh? Yeah. Yeah. As long <laughs> as I, I just have to always, you know, remember <clears throat> when I feel that, that like, like I'm off center is when I realize I'm trying to drive instead of letting God drive. I, I absolutely, okay. my girls will tell you this, you know, I'm not, when I'm feeling like, Ugh, I think, Oh, Oh, okay. I got to get out of the driver's seat. I've said that a yeah. million times in front of the girls. They know what I'm talking about. When I say that, just let God okay. drive. <laughs> well, we have run out of time. So uh, why don't you tell us your contact information? If there's someone out there who wants to donate or wants to get involved, or maybe wants to work for you, how can they get a hold of you? Well, you first you can you can call my cell phone because right now I guess should I put my cell? You're going to give us your cell phone number. Wow. Yes, I am. Okay, <laughs> so because I might have to change it though, but I'll give it to you okay. right. Six six one six four four seven seven zero three. That's my business cell. Okay. Um, and then my email. You can go to our website at um, www dot exclusively first responders with an S at the end, and it's all spelled out, dot .org. Um, email, you can email uh, me directly at linder. that's L-I-N-D-E-R, at exclusivelyfirstresponders.org. Dot .org. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was very, very valuable information. And uh, just a reminder to all our listeners out there that this will become a recorded podcast. And um, another reminder that my newly released book, Secrets from the Hammock, Uncommon Wisdom for Uncommon Times, is spreading wisdom all over the world, available wherever books are sold. And also on my free membership website, caregiverdave.com. Also join my Caregiver Dave Facebook community of 34,000 caregivers where you learn all about my new caregiver wellness retreat and mastermind in Acapulco that I offer to burned out caregivers trying to keep as many as them alive since 30% of caregivers die before their loved ones do. <laughs> and if you click the like or follow button on whatever platform you're watching or listening to this interview on, it helps us reach even more caregivers by improving Google search engine algorithms. So thank you again, all my listeners out there all over the world for tuning in every Wednesday and making us the number one caregiver podcast on the internet. So until next week, same time, same channel. May God richly bless you. Bye-bye. Sometimes it feels like the sun will never rise, like the birds will never sing again.